Good morning, Laura. Good wonderful morning, Ben. That, wonderful that we finally have time to talk. I feel a little bit like I need to apologize that for the last two years we've, we've been in, in contact, but we just haven't had the opportunity to actually talk in person, um, apart from a, a podcast I think we were on um, mm -hmm. together just, just recently, but, but that wasn't an opportunity to talk either. So really excited to finally speak with you. And, and it's kind of an experiment to have this conversation of two people actually getting to know each other. And, and <laughs> we, we can always decide to not share the recording at the end if we don't feel like it, but wonderful to meet you. Hi. Thank you so much, Daniel. I've been looking forward to, to sharing this with you. I, I just to, um, looked at your uh, website and your, your bio a little bit and then I suddenly thought we might actually have been more than once in the same room mm. in 2009 when you worked in Copenhagen for COP15 um, and, and, and launched the whole Sustainia thing um, because I was at the opening of the Sustainia exhibition um, in Copenhagen uh, during, really? during COP. And I was also where it's even more likely that we could have even had a conversation is, did you go to the YGL dinner um, that the brother of Thomas Amakura was hosting just after the opening of Sustainia? No, I was aware of it, but I couldn't for some reason. So there's probably been many, many times where we've either been in the same room or I'm pretty sure we haven't talked. I'm good at remembering people that way. So we, we haven't talked, but we've definitely been in the same field for a very long time because I worked a lot within climate change policy and helping kind of create awareness in the global business community around the importance of a strong global deal and, the, and a level playing field. That was 10, 15 years ago. In and then Copenhagen, Copenhagen was such a disappointment. I, I, I yeah. remember in the run up to Copenhagen, there was the, the civil society was really active trying to make Copenhagen the, the, the Paris basically five years earlier, um, yeah. six years, uh, five years earlier. But, but then it, it, it backfired completely. It, it was the exact opposite of what we'd been hoping for. Like I, I remember Bill Kibben, writing to me when they brought 350.org to, to Europe um, in the run-up to Copenhagen. And, and I got him in touch with, with Satish and with uh, Ross Jackson and a number of kind of network players in, in, in Europe. And, and I really thought that Copenhagen was going to be the game changer. And then I also felt that lo lots of people actually got so burned out with that disappointment. And, yes. and it took a couple of years to Yes. overcome come that. How, how did you live that? Because you actually headed the, the Danish Climate Council in the run-up to that? It was a global alliance. Um, it came about when, um, on the day when, when Denmark was given um, the role as being the host of this important process, um, mm -hmm. everyone thought that this would be the successor to the Kyoto Protocol. Um, I just by chance I was in a meeting with the, the then Danish Minister of Environment, Connie Hidega, who ended up heading the whole UNFCCC process. Um, and the Danish, or the, the sorry, the Australian uh, scientist and author of many wonderful books, uh, Tim Flannery. Mm -hmm. He's written Weather Makers and The Time Is Now and many really brilliant books. Um, we were in a meeting together and Connie was excited because it has just been announced that Denmark, Denmark would be hosting this important process, something that she had built, um, kind of, she had lobbied for and built momentum for, for a very long time. Not alone, of course, but it was something that she has worked hard on for a long time. So there was excitement in the room. And then we asked her, what, what do you need? How can we help support this process? Um, and Tim was very good friends with Richard Branson and is very well connected uh, with many global energy utilities, both from, from China and the US. Um, and she, she said, what you could do the most is help create momentum and awareness in the global business community. So six weeks after that meeting, we launched the Copenhagen Climate Council, which was an alliance of people like Richard Branson, um, James Lovelock, um, and also CEOs of energy utilities like China Powers, uh, Duke Energy, um, a few Scandinavian energy utilities. 
So it was an alliance of, of business executives, climate scientists, um, and, and policy designers. So they were working together, um, and I was a part of heading that process. I was the, I was the director of, 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 of that initiative. Um, and intensely for almost three years, we traveled around with Danish um, negotiators, helping to, cr to create local roundtables with energy executives and, and business executives in Mumbai, Beijing, Detroit, um, many cities in, 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 the, in the Europe as well. The, those three years are running up to 2009 and yes exactly we we launched uh, the Copenhagen climate council in in may 2007 um six weeks after we we were given uh, the role as hosting the the, the unf triple c process leading up to cop 15 and and then intensely up until december 2009 we were we were building advocacy and we were we and we were kind of constantly um, pushing the message about the strong business case mm -hmm. of a strong global deal and trying to make the global business world aware of what important things were going on in Copenhagen in December. Because it's something, the COP process, it's different now after Paris and after Copenhagen, but back then it was something almost no one outside that establishment knew about. So it wasn't something that the global business community had on their radar, maybe a few of course, but it wasn't something that, that kind of had a lot of awareness. So we helped build awareness around that, not alone, of course. And, and I completely agree with you. There was such an exciting momentum leading up to COP15. COP and many people were giving their heart and soul because it was perceived or it was looked upon as this historic time in mankind. This was the time that we could kind of put our our societies on a more sustainable trajectory. So yes, many people did nothing but work, myself included, didn't have kids at the time. I did nothing but traveling, nothing but working, put in everything that I had. Um, we also did the business equivalent of the COP15 six months prior um, in the same venue as the COP15 was, was hosted. I don't know if you were there, but at the Bella Center, we hosted the equivalent of that for the business community. So we had all the, the, the key negotiators from all key countries present. And with them was formulated the business community's recommendations to a new treaty, uh, what we call the Copenhagen Call. And that was an alliance um, alongside World Business uh, Council for Sustainable Development, World Economic Forum, all the kind of established institutions that had an an angle both in, within environmentalism, sustainable development, climate change, and the business community were, were involved in that process. We had a, a goal there, we had, we had Ban Ki-moon there, we had everyone there six months prior. It was seen as sort of like a rehearsal. Um, and there was such an exciting momentum and such great hope and promise and optimism. And that was hosted in, in end of May. And then in October, things just started to fall apart. I, 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 I lived it through the, the Klima Forum, the, the, the sort of alternative side, side event that always happens when the, the COP goes on. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, I think it was actually Jim Garrison's 2020 climate leadership campaign that, that kind of tried to launch around that time just before COP and then very quickly fell apart. But they, they sent me there as a sort of representative um, and, and be, um, Morel Foreman with the Global Mesh Work was organizing a big event at the Klima, Klima Forum to, trying to bring transition towns and eco-villages and Dragon Dreaming and um, all these different organizations together. And so I was more on the side of the NGOs and the civil society. Yeah. And and I rem just recently I talked to Albert Bates and Albert's been to most of the cops in the last fifteen years, and um, I remember him going to the Bella Center on a on a pass that we got through um, Jen because Jen is an EcoSoc um, yeah. NGO and and um, I never actually got a pass to go into the Bella Center, but every time Albert came back, he was more and more disappointed, and it, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, it was crazy, and, but, but and just kind of witnessing how that because things started to crumble and fall apart already in October. Um, 
mainly due to to ego. Um, but witnessing those two weeks in the Bella Center was just, I mean, it was excruciating. You could see there was still some hope in the beginning and then things just started to fall apart badly and you could just see it in people's eyes. And it was something that took me a long time to recover from. And, and, and I, I'm not alone, I wasn't alone. There was a lot of people that had like proper PTSD afterwards. Yeah. It's just been yeah. a nightmare. And, and how did like the, the, the I went to the opening of Sustainia, the exhibition, but I must admit, I don't, I didn't ever really understand what Sustainia was taking to the world, like showcasing good sustainability projects. But you, you did that in parallel to, to this because Sustainia was launched. I think what, what you witnessed was not, um, what you witnessed in 2009 was not um, Sustainia yet, it, it, but it was a showcase of sustainable solutions. Sustainia as an organization came about later. So um, in the months after COP15, I was just kind of taking a break. I had never finished my, my thesis. Uh, I, had, I had put that on hold in 2007. I was in the, in the process of, of, of writing my, my, my academic thesis in 2007. Is that for the business degree you did in London? Or? Yes, partly in London. And, but, but my focus in my, in my thesis was about barriers um, when implementing a low carbon business strategy. That was the, the framing of, of, at the time. So I interviewed um, global executives from multinational companies on their approach to sustainability strategy and, and when does it succeed? What are the main barriers? What are the main kind of opportunities? So, so my business degree had always been focused on this, had a sustainability angle to it. Um, anyways, so I did that, I completed my thesis, um, and then I went to San Francisco just to get away from Copenhagen. Um, and I had a desperate longing for a completely new approach to talking about sustainability. I was so fed up with a very complex technical language that turned a lot of people off and, and, and was a very elitist language. The whole Copenhagen process had also one of the kind of, I think, major fails, failings of that was that it was, it was a very exclusive process using a language that very few people could connect to. But also the whole rhetoric of um, a sustainable future is about letting things go. It's about a poor standard of living. It's about giving things up, which doesn't really create the excitement and the momentum that we need. Um, in, in, in the community at large. So um, I wrote in San Francisco, I wrote Guide to Sustainia and interviewed many kind of experts in climate change communication and in communications experts and, 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 and was trying just as a sort of like a, a little hobby project. Um, how can we find a new narrative? And then we have... So, sorry, just, just for clarification. So this writing this guide for Sustainia was was you getting you thinking in order to then launch Sustainia or was it yeah. already an organization that that supported you at the time? But I didn't know at the time. So I finished my thesis, went to San Francisco, um, wrote the guide to Sustainia. Was excited about how can we create a new exciting narrative? How can we make sustainability fun and exciting? Because I felt that was needed after the kind of big depression and big kind of breakdown and uh, doing COP15. Then um, I, I led a project that was uh, a one year project alongside communications experts, but also companies about how can we revitalize the agenda? How can we um, build the momentum, the amazing momentum that we had leading up to COP15? Is there a way we can rekindle that so we don't lose everything on the floor? So um, I decided, designed with other people, of course, a one year process of what can we do to do that. One of the, the, the things that was fed into that was that book that I wrote called Guide to Sustainia. Um, and Guide to Sustainia was a vision of a sustainable future based on the solutions and technologies we had available back then. I wrote that in 2010. Um, and in the process of writing that, it became clear that there was a big potential here. And the Guide to Sustainia upon launching it was read, read, read by many people. 
So we fundraise to build an actual organization around Sustainia. And we got on Schwarzenegger as the chair. We have the musician, musician um, Farrell Williams involved. Uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland was involved. Christiana Figueres was involved. Many people of a caliber that, that agreed that we need something new and exciting. Um, and we need a new language around sustainability, but we also need to make solutions and technologies approachable. So what kind of solutions does exist out there? One of the flagship projects of Sustainia was the annual Sustainia 100 solutions portfolio. So within 10 different sectors, what kind of great solutions exist already now that we can just start implementing? When, um, when, when, you, when you look back at that work now, um, ten, 10 years later almost um, do you, like was it mainly technology focused um, and industry focused what you highlighted or to what extent because now your work is so much um, also about the slowing down and the, the deeper listening and the, the, the kind of shift in consciousness and shift in way of being that, that happens when you deeply connect with nature and mm -hmm. um, and relearn how deeply we are part of nature and um, how, how strongly were those narratives already feeding in back then or, or is that something that that is is, is, is a kind of new addition in, in your life uh it was not feeding in mm. not really yeah. um and to be completely honest because i had a massive transformation happening because i in five and a half almost six years ago i had a minor traumatic brain injury, which meant I couldn't do anything for almost two years. Um, and we can maybe go back to that because back then Sustainia was looking back, I felt like I slightly played the role when I was, <laughs> when I was out giving keynotes and talks, I was putting on a pink suit and lots of colors and lots of kind of, I was really keen on revitalizing this field that I had been passionate about since I, as an eight year old, started campaigning to buy up pieces of the Amazon forest and I went there to work as, an, as a volunteer. Anyways, it was something I was very passionate about and I felt that uh, we had to make solutions more available, not just, it wasn't just a technology solution to answer your questions, it was also about what kind of, what can we learn from community projects, what can we learn from NGOs, what can we learn, how can uh, public school teachers start to teach um, in, in new ways about sustainability. So education was a major pillar as well. We work with, uh, with global university, universities like Harvard in terms of how can we make this more accessible to students, how can universities transform to sustainability, but it was very head driven to answer your question. Very head driven in terms of my focus was how can we make this more relatable? How can we make more people get excited about sustainable solutions and, and, and the sustainable transformation of our societies? How can we make innovations and community projects? Um, how can we make those the new stars? How can we make that popular? That was, that was my intent at the time because I felt that that was very much needed. Um, and then I had a massive, um, my, my own massive breakdown because I was going at such a high speed. I was traveling nonstop. I was so committed to this mission. I also became a mother for the first time in 2013. So I had a lot of things going on. And then I was in an accident. Um, and from one day to the next, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to do anything. So this accident happened after, after your first child was born? Yeah, she was two at the time. Wow, it must be so hard to be in, undergoing a personal health trauma when you, when you really want to be there for, for the little yeah, one. Yeah, that was crazy, crazy. Yeah. And, and you, like I, you mentioned this in, 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 on your website, that, that it literally you, you couldn't listen to anything and like you were almost in isolation um, due to this. Yeah, for, for at least a year, it was um, in terms of, of, of being a mother, it was like being with her for 10 minutes, go back to my room and sleep for half an hour, go out for 10 minutes. But it was, 
my brain simply could not compute anything, no kind of input. Um, and, and, and a two-year-old is uh, it, just that kind of my brain couldn't compute when things were moving too quickly. Um, and, with, and with young kids, you know that as well as a father to, uh, I think Lucia is about three years old, right? She, they, you need to be kind of all over the place with them. Yeah. And that was really hard. Um, and, and I couldn't listen to podcasts or watch television or anything. I couldn't read, I couldn't write, I couldn't do anything for about a year and a half, I think. And then slowly the progress and the healing started to happen. And, and what's your deepest learning from that? I mean, it, it, that's, I mean, that's like, I mean, you, you, you didn't choose it because it was an accident, but it's, it's similar to what Tibetan monks do when they go off into a cave for um, first four months and then 12 months and then even longer. Yeah. Um, I mean, you must have had some pretty deep insights by that radically slowing down and it was a massive learning and it's something that I'm incredibly grateful for. Of course, it was traumatic mm -hmm. um, and there has had to be a lot of healing happening, happening on, on many levels, uh, going through something like that as a mother, as a partner, as a, as a human being. And it was a massive um, slowly letting go of who I was. Um, I used to be the kind of very, I, I mean, because my educational background is within business with a sustainability focus, but still I was like, I had that kind of drive and I, I've been, I've been a, a leader and been the, this, the executive or CEO of things since I was 28. Um, I've had that in my personality, that kind of type A, let's get things done, let's get executed all over the place. So that kind of part of my personality was really trying to do its best to, although it couldn't because it was physically impossible, but I really tried my best for the first many months to try and project manage my healing. And it's really, it's funny now looking back at that um, and, and just kind of witnessing that part of me dying and not that kind of, breakthrough and breakdown on a mini level that was happening on a daily basis of not being able to let go of that part of my personality. And it was actually thanks in many ways to the COP21 in Paris. So uh, the accident happened in, in July and I was supposed to head a big thing in, in, in Paris with, uh, with Sustain, you know, with something we had worked on for a very long time. And I just could not let that go. And I kept telling myself that of course I would heal in advance of that or before that, so I'd be able to go. And then two or three weeks prior COP21, I was just like, Laura, this is insane. This is insane. You can't even go out the door. You can't even go to, to, to the local shop to buy groceries. I mean, thinking that you can even get yourself to an airport. And I mean, it's just, it's insanity. You have to let go now. So a, a symbolic action, I, I booked on that day of realizing that a really long way of healing was ahead of me. I booked a silent retreat for five days um, that started on the same day as the COP21 started. And I went into the forest and I went into, I started to embrace silence completely from then on. And something radically shifted within me that then. That must be so hard to let go of, like when you've, when you've not only sort of have, have that in you as, as a personality trait, but also you, you're really successful because then the world outside creates a momentum that, that sort of expects you to be there and continue what people project onto you and to let yeah. go of that entire, um, as, it, as you were speaking, I was reminded of this, this D.H. Lawrence quote, which I saw a couple of days ago, um, maybe you're a prisoner to your idea of yourself. Yes, yeah. exactly. And, <laughs> and yeah, and I mean, my ego had become dependent on getting that kind of, on the success and being kind of acknowledged and celebrated and, 
and letting go of that was really hard as well. Um, and that and that didn't just happen at that moment. It was it was still a long journey of just kind of, but a really healthy journey and something that I'm really happy about today because ha having let go of that part of my personality is 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 a big relief. Um, and it's funny because I, I mean, many people that have known me have not known me before. They cannot get their heads around me having used to be this very little because now I'm very much in tune with nature cycles. Right now, I take it very seriously in a good way that we are going through winter. Um, I don't want to have too many things on my plate. I want to enjoy life and I want to have time to constantly tune in with nature. Um, and that was one of the things that I realized in my healing process. Um, and you asked me whether the intelligence of nature and, and consciousness and spirituality had been present in my work before, and, and it had not. I remember sitting at many um, COP negotiations or, or, or being at conferences that had a sustainability focus and was wondering why people never talked about nature. But it was only like... Uh, why is that not happening? Because nature had been an integral part of my life growing up and also why I wanted to go to the Amazon to, to work on restoring rainforests. That had been kind of what I thought as a kid would be my life trajectory. And I remember having these kind of, I mean, why are we not talking about nature here? Why are we not talking about restoring forests? Why are we not talking about, why is this such a technical issue? But I was just kind of ignoring that because that was not really part of, um, of the communities that I was involved in. But it was something that I could not ignore any longer in my healing process. Nature was the only place where I felt I could heal. And that started that kind of rekindling and reconnection within me about learning from the intelligence of nature and how can I, all the knowledge that I had about climate change and sustainability and, and that whole field, that realization that we are missing the point, guys. We're missing the point. We need a completely new approach. Um, and we need a greater space for talking about inner ecosystem healing. Because I've never seen people more stressed or depressed than people working in, in, in climate change and sustainability. They are, they are so stressed out and they don't have that realization that they keep adding degenerative ripple effects to the cause that they're passionate about through their behavior, through their approaches that is often very mechanistic and very competitive. It's fascinating because if you think about the, the one little breakthrough that we had in the, in the long history of um, UN climate negotiations with, with Paris, um, I think part of it is to attribute, or at least I attribute part of it to, to that, that when Christiana Figueres worked, like she, she, she got Tom Rivet Carmack as her chief of staff in the run-up to, um, to COP21. And I met Tom many years ago at Schumacher College when he was coming in and out of the college as a helper, and then he would disappear to do Vipassana retreats, and then he'd come back and spend another few weeks as a helper at the college, and then disappear again. And even after that, he even went to Thailand and became a monk. And yeah. and and then coming back from Thailand, he re reconnected with, with folks at Schumacher, and I think met um, Nigel Topping and, and, and Paul Dickinson, and somehow ended up heading um, the Carbon Disclosure Project in New York, and that's how he then connected with, with Christiana. But I think it is that deep spiritual grounding and oh, that, yeah. that sitting in the fire um, with all the madness of the UN um, climate process. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, he tells this wonderful story in, in the book they wrote together, The, 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 the World We Choose, um, of with this little, I don't know if, did you see his TED talk? It's, it's really worth watching where, where he tells the story of um, a little note that Christiana passed him yes. those really frustrating meetings and it just said approach with love. Yes. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's really, like sometimes it's these deeper connections that actually unlock yeah. 
the, the when when we come in too much from the head and too much from the I have no mind. doubt that that was the secret recipe of hers and I've witnessed her firsthand and I've been to many meetings um, with her and watched her how she approached negotiation and how she has a deeply rooted spirituality with her wherever she goes. And people sense that and feel that regardless of whether they believe, think of themselves as being spiritual human beings. Um, with Nicolas Hulot, she also orchestrated alongside other organizations um, uh, six months prior to the, the COP21, they had um, the Summit of Conscience and, and I was involved in that and I was supposed to have gone, but it was a week after my accident. So of course I couldn't go, but it was uh, a below the radar meeting. There wasn't much kind of um, noise about it, but it was key negotiators and spiritual leaders from all religious backgrounds that spent a day and a half together. Um, and, and, and it was, I mean, it was a passion project for Christiana and they were all prepped um, to go there with their hearts first. They were not allowed to have PowerPoint slides or decks or prepared speeches, but they were all uh, kind of um, instructed or th their only kind of guideline for, for this summit in advance was to come with your heart first, speak from the heart. So it was um, a day and a half where all religious religions were presented and all religions um, took turns in facilitating their version of a meditation. And then key negotiators and, and, and other influential people that, that played a critical role in the COP21 process was asked to speak from the heart, asking one question only. What is the legacy you want to leave behind? And um, it was, I'm told, because I couldn't go because of the accident, that it was such a rich experience. There were so many tears and it was just like something cracked at that important meeting in that important summit um, and I'm not saying that was the only thing that made a difference but it, it was one of the, the approaches that Christiana had that just created an in a completely different space for human connection and connection with what matters the most um, and it was interesting because I, I had been part of the preparatory process and I remember that my Taipei personality in the beginning had a really hard time with the approach of every time the kind of preparatory meetings and of organizers were present. Um, it was at a, either a monastery was one of the, the gatherings. And I remember that the approach was very much one of holding hands and talking from the heart. And, and I was not there yet. This was in 2014, beginning of 2015. I was not there yet. And I, was, I remember how unpleasant I felt and how I kept uh, destroying the process with my craving for an agenda or a craving for, okay, who's doing what now? And guys, we don't have time for this. We have, we, have, we have to save the planet. We don't have time for holding hands or speaking from the heart. I remember being so annoyed with that. I've, I've been in circles with people like that, yeah. yeah and, 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 and today it's, it's really valuable for me to having been like that. Mm. Um, because I, I, that's, what, that's what I'm realizing is that there's, like, it's wonderful to hear this story from you because it's, it's sort of like journeys from um, two sides of the same bridge um, coming like for because, because for me it was almost the opposite journey of, yeah. of like even like when we're talking about what ha where were we in COP 15 um, you were there with the business people in the Bella Center I was there with the activists in uh, and and back then I was still a little bit sort of oh, business is just going the wrong way that's just driving the madness of the industrial growth society and and um, they were the other they they yeah. were yeah, and and my learning in those ten years since COP fifteen um, has been that they're not the other; that we're all part of this large transforming process, and that that we need everybody on board, and um, and that you you can actually work with business, and that they're wonderful, deeply spiritual, and deep thinking yeah. people in in many business organizations, and actually 
some of the most successful organizations are run by people who are um, extreme sport and nature enthusiasts who spend time in the Andes or, um, I mean, just thinking of um, Yvonne Conrad or, or um, Doug Tompkins and all these people who, who build multi-billion dollar companies, but really because of their connection to nature. Um, and, yeah. and, and so, so it, I think that this is, this is the big bridge we need to yes. Um, and and it's we, I feel like one of the problems that social media has brought in is this cancelling culture and and very quickly opposing culture and, and what we see in America at the moment this this splitting of not having a spectrum anymore not not celebrating the the dynamic creative tension across the polarities yes. of opposites but but seeing it as either or and if you just say this one word then I can already put you into that box and not listen to you anymore because you're one of the others and that's so dangerous and and i feel like our our work is to keep building the bridge and rebuilding the bridge as people keep burning it down because they they want to other people and it's it's exactly. really we play different roles on that bridge and we are i mean some of some play the role of being holding the very strong vision of a regenerative society without ever kind of in their opinion, diluting what they do. Um, and I'm coming from the approach of ever since, ever since I was in the Amazon forest, I was like, okay, I, the most destructive force on this planet is business. With, I can change that. If I can help inspire a movement within the business community, we will have come a long way. And, and also because of my need for action, it felt like I could quicker change things than, than the NGO world. I, got it, I, I thought I was going into the NGO world, but I got a bit kind of fed up with, the, with what I experienced as a lack of, of speed. And, and you are incredibly right that that ability for everyone to hold the tension within them, holding of the opposites is of paramount importance. We don't have time to spend time figuring out what is wrong with, with the other's approach. We need to understand that we are all, we all cells in this organism trying to hopefully rebirth um, a new era. And we are playing different roles and we have different vocabulary and we have different uh, constituents and communities that we can inspire. So the more we, we collaborate and see ourselves as, as, as kindred spirits, the quicker I believe we will create the momentum needed. Yeah, no, it's one, one thing that has been sinking into me ever since I was on that point in my book writing process when I wrote Designing Regenerative Cultures, um, there's this clear point where, where I suddenly realized the power of a question-based approach rather than a solution and answer-based approach. And, and you know, there's 250 questions in the book and so on, but, but it's actually since then that I've, I've realized that there's another dimension that I don't even make quite as explicit in the book yet to this shift, this epistemological shift. And it's, it's not saying that we don't need to have solutions and implement and find answers, mm. but, but if you literally give the priority to the question and see the question as the enduring thing and the answer and the solution as the transitory exploration of mm. working, living that question, something happens that is actually to me increasingly, I feel like that's the key to holding the spectrum again like holding the different perspectives in the room, holding our diversity, not coming to this, not this, like letting go of the stupid idea that we all need to agree on everything before yes. we move forward. Because if that's going to kill us, if we, yes. if we hold on to that. Yeah? But if we, if we understand that nobody's got the perfect answer, nobody's got the perfect solution, nobody holds the gospel of the one way to do regenerative work, we all are in that exploratory journey of how to come home to to being life again to your journey of why do we not talk about nature uh, like even getting like that's the first step but in but, but eventually you then realize when you listen deeply 
the nature is everywhere. And for me, the, the big the big challenge now is to to walk through a concrete jungle of a major city, and truly see nature there as well. Um, yes. to sit in front of my computer, which I don't prefer to being out on the land, but but to understand that all of either all of it is part of this transforming whole and life's exploration of novelty or or none of it is. Yeah? So so nature is really the umbrella that that has brought us forth and and, and that we're expressions of. Um, exactly. So, so but but by keeping keeping with the questions and holding solutions and answers more lightly, we can truly access collective intelligence. Yes. Um, and but it comes with another bit which is the bit of yes we need answers and we need solutions but they need to be at the appropriate scale then like if we do that the answers and solutions at the local and bioregional scale where the feedback is quicker and we mm -hmm. it's complex enough like it's it's not reducing complexity of a situation by abstracting into some sort of theory of principles and and guidelines to follow but it's 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 reducing complexity by embracing the specificity of a place and a region and then and then you you've created one container which you say this is the region where i take my stance with the people who are here with all the diversity of opinions and all the problems but then that's already a massive reduction of complexity than if you try to do it in a way that everybody could do everywhere all the time um, because every place is different um, mm -hmm. and, and and so i i think that those two things of, of understanding how do we fit our patterns into the right scales again. Like my big learning as an ecologist, biologist, evolutionary scientist before I got into sustainability is, is really about this, this structured scale linking way that nature um, doesn't have those boundaries of the local, the bioregional, the national, the global. It's, it's all one process and all boundaries are places of connection and, and relationship rather than separation and kind of identity to create other. Um, exactly. Yeah. So it's, I, it's just fascinating to, to have this, like to see how your journey and my journey have kind of converged on a common common path now. I, I would love to hear your reflections, having been on this journey, um, because it's it's the same. Like there's some people out there, some who might listen to this conversation, who the minute you you mention something like the World Economic Forum, oh, like the, and and then you, how is like now when you take a compassionate and critical reflection on your engagement as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum and that world of the Richard Branson's B teams and so on. I mean, they're all wonderful people. I know you, you know, common, we have a common friend, Marcello Palazzi, who brought the um, social venture network to Europe and then later B Corps to Europe. Um, these, are, these are passionate people, or, or Tom and Christiana, who, who are still working with the business world and now Nigel Topping um, as, as the, the um, high level champion for the UK for COP26, um, doing exactly the same thing again, like really building global alliances, preparing, having been gifted another year because of the pandemic, preparing even deeper now. I, I have high hopes that sh things will shift in Glasgow, but, um, but how would you, like, like on that fine line of critiquing and being compassionate how, how do you now see the work of the WEF and these these business um, forums what, what would you say to them if they they listened yeah. and thankfully they do listen because I'm part of the YTL community and that just give me that gives me an access mm -hmm. so I've had WEF people I'm, I'm employees and, and executives from WEF join some of, um, of my nature immersions um, that I've helped alongside Giles Hutchins, who, whom um, I wrote Regenerative Leadership with. And um, I have been given the chance to facilitate quite a few workshops and presentations for the WEF community. Mm -hmm. So I see myself as, <laughs> as um, not a toy and a horse, but, uh, but it's a way to inspire and just about to use the word infiltrate um but i think i mean i can speak the language of business thanks to my background and thanks to my experience 
Um, but I also have a deep understanding now of, of, of how can we redesign our, our approach in the business world in a way that has a sacred, respectful relationship with nature. What is the regenerative way of doing business? And what has changed even in the, the span of three years is, is mind blowing. The receptivity in that community to that message has changed radically in, in only three years. And that gives me so much hope. I may be seen as, as, as in, at least in the beginning, as, 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 as slightly crazy in that community when I kind of talked about the importance of, it, of aligning with nature's intelligence and those kind of things. And it didn't make sense to them until you had some time to unfold. What does a business align with nature? What does that look like, feel like? What kind of organization is that? Um, but I think we are going through a, a global planetary metamorphosis and business people are human beings as well. And, and the importance for them to leave a legacy is, is just as present as in, in anyone else. And of course, that doesn't go for all business people. Some are only focused on shareholder value, optimization and bottom line. But there is an increasing focus on if we want to be around. Also, 10 years from now, um, it's, it's the awareness around survival in the longer run. Um, and, and, and 10 years is not longer run, but it is important for them to realize that we are living on a planet of, of massive ecosystem uh, degradation and we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Our workforce have never been more stressed and burned out today. So that realization has made them receptive to a great extent of the message of regenerative business. Regenerative business that has this holistic approach to both our inner and our outer ecosystems. Um, and I think that's very, very promising. Um, people are, they are actually reading the book um, and are taking that seriously and bringing that forward. And, and, and it, there was discussions around whether uh, there could even be a workshop about regenerative leadership at the Davos meeting. Um, that is not going ahead now because it's been canceled. But there is a, an, an openness in that community. I find it interesting though that, that um, I mean, first of all, with these kind of nature emerge, immersion type workshops, I've, I've for, for many years been involved in that, that field, sort of rites of passage work and um, worked with Joanna Macy in 2003 in, um, on, on the work that reconnects. And um, also a lot of the work that the, in, in the educational programs I've, I've organized for Gaia Education and, and, and designed for Gaia Education hold these components. But what's, what's very common with the increasingly diverse um, groups of people that, that take these kind of courses, like more and more business people um, are, and, and, and policy makers are, are joining these type of courses, but it's, it's a common experience that people connect and have a really deep personal experience, but then to bring it back yeah. into their daily life is like hitting a wall at 180 kilometers an hour. It's yeah. just, it doesn't compute, it doesn't fit. Yeah. And, and, and so people get frustrated. Some people drop out of that world and, and do something else. Um, very few people really take those experiences into a truly transformative process. And what, 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 one thing that you just said sort of made, made me, um, understand something or, or remember something really, which is too much of this conversation in the business world is still around, how can we be around in 10 years and 10 years isn't a long time, how can we be around in 100 years? I've been working with a company that that is in that large scale, long-term thinking because of the nature of the, the industry they're in. And they, they think in 100 year time spans. Um, yeah. but, but the very question of, how can we be around in a hundred years might not be the appropriate one mm -hmm. because um, particularly with large corporations, my like without 
bedeviling the, the, the organizations or the people in it. There's huge capacity and human potential in these organizations and they've got wonderful skill sets and, and, and um, but the very structure is out of scale with and out of sync with the mm -hmm. temporal and spatial scales by which nature creates healthy systems. They are literally too big not to fail. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the challenging um, question to, to ponder that I usually leave when I don't get the opportunities that often because maybe I'm still a little bit too radical, but um, when, when I get to talk to people in large corporations, I, I very often ask the, the same question. It's like, could it be that you're too big not to fail? Could, could it be that your challenge is to reinvent yourself mm -hmm. In this process, as you, you said, we're, we're in this global metamorphosis. I, I love Joanna Macy's framing of this, this dual role of midwife and, yes. and hospice worker. Um, and, and in the hospice working of these structures that are too big not to fail, I'm, I'm wondering whether the, the work is, how do we, as a global company, reinvent ourselves in very close connection to, to place, to community, to bioregion, and become the enablers of a new type of enterprise that is a bioregional cooperative that, that brings us in and our knowledge and what we do, but brings in the community of that place and forms a new entity. And, mm -hmm. and to, to almost hospice themselves out of existence while midwifing a whole host of globally networked and globally co uh, collaborative, but appropriate scale and place focused entities. And, and I, I feel like that's the conversation that, that we need to take to WEF and, right. and, and these uh, corporations. And, and it's very few organizations that, that are willing that to have- That would be interesting to propose that to them. And, and that's something we could potentially work on. Um, and of course, it's always scary if, I mean, we have an ingrained deep fear of talking about death, right? That is infiltrating our, uh, the consciousness of our society because we, we, are, we are so, so afraid of, of, of dying and letting go of what we're, what, because, what, we're, because we what. don't understand who we are. Like exactly. the, the core is you're only afraid of dying if you're trapped in the skin and captured ego. <laughs> that thinks that it's all about this lifetime or it's all about the company with this logo. Yes. yes. And they will fight to the nail for their old concept of the kind of legacy that they had envisioned for themselves to leave behind would, will still be able to, to be left behind instead of going where you suggest we go. I will say though, um, and let's get back to how we could do that. But I will say though, though that, that is what I'm seeing starting to happen, at least with, with, with especially when it's founder owned, mm -hmm. um, when it's kind of, when it's, or has a generational, if it's owned by generations and there's a handing over to the next generation. I have seen that again and again, that there is a, the new generation want to be sustainable and maybe even regenerative and have that approach integrated throughout everything within their organism as a living system. And in that space, some really exciting things are happening. That is exactly what you mentioned. That are exactly are, how can we hold the tension of, of radically redesigning who we are while slowly but surely um, shutting down the parts of our value chain that is uh, degenerative. It's, it's fascinating because it's, a. Uh, um the the shift there is so ingrained into the, the, the system that we build like you're saying um founder owned or family owned businesses like basically businesses who haven't launched publicly yet and aren't behold to shareholder maximization of shareholder value can do these pivots much more in a much more agile way and and the the, the large a mining company that, that I've been working with through through another um, like I'm subcontracted as a as a consultant to this process. Um, they they're capable of 
buying back their own stock in mm-hmm. order to um, position themselves in a place where they can actually do the pivoting. Because mm-hmm. because if if you if you spread into lots of people's ownership um, that just play in the global casino, very often it's not even people anymore, but it's large portfolio organizations mm-hmm. that, that that manage money for people. Um, it's very difficult to, to to pivot. So so it's like where the the structural the playing field of a structurally degenerative economic and monetary system um, is holding business in a in a kind of dead end at the moment that like it's so many business leaders that i've i've talked to i think like the honest ones are saying instead of saying oh we're now a regenerative company because they're just rebranding from oh we yeah. were sustainable and now we're regenerative but the truly honest ones never say we're regenerative they're saying it's it's a journey where like it's a, it's a direction exactly. of travel exactly. um like lush calls it a direction of travel which i think is a lovely term uh, yes. um we shouldn't say that we shouldn't move fast and deeply and transformatively, but but it's um, but it's acknowledging that while you're still playing to the non-zero sum mm. rules of a win-lose economic system, you there's only so much you can do. Mm. Um, to like and 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 I see this in some companies that I've been working with. It's almost like a little bit. Um, schizophrenic that that on the one hand there's this energy that goes into oh the business isn't going so well we need to sort that one out and then when the business comes back up they kind of go oh now we can finally go back into doing our all our wonderful uh, yeah. positive impact work and and of course they 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 can see that if we don't have a business we can't do the positive impact and it's true but but the deadlock is is really um how do we change like redesign the the plane in mid flight how do we how, and and how do we change businesses while the playing field needs changing at the yeah, same time. And, and what I what what I'm experiencing is that the, the the ability and capability of executives having that carrying capacity of uh, being able to hold space, mm-hmm. being able to hold space for the new to emerge in a way where they don't approach strategy processes in an old rigid way of now we need to come up with q1 q2 targets and we need to roll out and um, some of the processes that 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 Giles and i are involved in right now is incredibly fascinating where yes part of their part of their value chain and part of their lines of production is to some extent their old sustainable lines um, but then they are in a process of holding space for the new to emerge having a strong vision of where do we want to be in terms of, of being a regenerative business in the future they don't call themselves that publicly yet but that's the vision and how can we then everyone learn to hold space learn to hold space for the old thing to die for the new to emerge both in terms of how we are interacting in our company, employee to employee, but also how we innovate. How can we access our creative ingenuity in a deeply, in a completely different way? You can't force um, company or you can't force, sorry, employees to be creative and innovative. There's something deeply to learn when you immerse yourself in in the ingenuity of nature and the and the rhythm of nature. So how can we do both? How can we both have this um, sacred attitude to being custodians of the planet also within this energetic vortex vortex of our organization, our organism, Um, while yes, there are parts of our value chains that is still operating slightly as business per usual, but we are constantly in that metamorphosis we are constantly in that process of emerging bit by bit and also having that patience that rome wasn't built in a day and that's also on a micro level was something that happened with me i had i, I went through a, a, a death and rebirth and it was not easy and it was traumatic um and there was days of enlightenment and excitement and then there was days of utter depression and and i went through something on a micro scale that global organizations and societies and nation states states will go through in the coming years. And we need that ability to go back to what we talked about in the beginning of holding the opposites 
um, and, and how can we have that compassionate caring capacity for the next step of our evolution? So how can you and I, just, uh, just as an example, how can you and I be space holders of a frequency within an organization and inspire them and accept that there's, it's not every part of their value chains that there is where we would like them to be, but how can we inspire each of the cells in that organism to advance to their next evolutionary potential? Yeah, no, because it is so much is, is shifting organizing ideas and you can do that in those moments where people have opened up maybe through some nature yes. connection type work that, that you suddenly, um, people start, just shifting one or two organizing ideas of how they see their business or their their purpose and then it's it's much more subtle it's not a it's not that linear kind of um, strategy plan type of transformation it's it's more a complex emergence of, yes. of understanding that if you change the enabling constraints and if you uh, change the organizing ideas the the, the, the initial like in, in your book, you call it DNA. I, I always have a little bit of an issue using the DNA metaphor because we've now learned so much that, that a DNA is it's much more complex than, than the mm -hmm. popular belief of it. Um, like this sort of, we have a code and now we run it. But, but um, it is about this trusting that if you make small changes in the hearts mm -hmm. and minds of people, that will have repercussions in the, yes. in the future and um and you can't really control what comes out but you can set conditions for what emerges to be more positive more regenerative more healing more more caring than than the the previous structure but uh, tell me a little, also, oh, oh, so, so, sorry i didn't want to, like just just to flag I, I would love to also talk about how you met giles and about your book that you wrote yes. Before we go there, I just wanted to quickly say, because you were speaking to something that I forgot to address that is incredibly important in terms of something that you and I are seeing again and again, that when people are taking a short course on a, or they go on an immersion on a workshop, they are excited and they feel connecting, connected to their sole purpose and, and then they meet the old real world again and they become depressed and they become like, okay, I, I got to leave that organization. Um, and that was that kind of um, need for um, regenerators to unite, to be holding each other's hands while going in there in the organization and start to be the re regenerative ripple effects and start to be those keystone species that can, that can, that can help change transformation processes in organization was part of the reason that Jenny and I also initiated the regenerators journey um because part of that was a community of kindred spirits and they was from you had architects designers executives present there and part of what we what we wanted to create was a confidential forum to to exactly share what is really hard in terms of building the bridge and taking this exciting knowledge and then implement it and integrate it and what can we learn from each other and i think that those kind of communities are are increasing in numbers, which is exactly what we need. And you are an amazing community space holder as well. How can we, how can we create those safe spaces for people to know that they're not alone on this journey, to learn from each other, inspired by, by each other, because we need the cells to be present in, 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 in every field of society. We can't just create our own little bubble, is at least my opinion. Um, but yes, going back to Giles and I, we actually met for the first time uh, three and a half years ago because we were both advising a process um, of um, pilgrim travelers. It was an alliance of um, organizations within um, pilgrim traveling to some extent that had some kind of approach to that because each year 330 million pilgrim travelers from different kinds of religions and all over the world are traveling to um are going on a pilgrimage and it's leaving behind other destruction um and it's 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 a really critical issue for many of these cities and many of these paths and trails that they are walking on so how can we have an, a restorative approach to that 
Um, and both he and I was advising that process. We met at a, at a meeting in London and we connected because we both had this deep passion about transforming vision, business to be rooted on the, on the intelligence of nature. And we both had worked for a long time in the business community, so we understood that kind of environment. So we connected and, um, and we started to facilitate retreats and immersions and workshops on regenerative leadership together quite quickly, actually. I think um, it was almost six, six months after we met for the first time, we, we launched our first project together. Um, and in that process, we just had a lot of learnings and discussions and how about we write a little handbook to hand out to, to retreat participants and that kind of grew into something bigger. And let's do a proper book. Um, when, when we had done that for about a year and a half, uh, we decided um, in the autumn of 2018 to put all of this content into a proper book and we dedicated um, six months to, to, to get all those kind of thoughts into, in a, into alignment and to actually write something that, that primarily business executives could access, but it's, 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 it's something that many politicians are also finding a lot of inspiration in, which is, which is very promising. So it was a very intense process of, of writing the book together, but it came about because we had a few years of experience of, of working together. And um, when you do these retreats, do, do you do them now with at Giles' new place outside of London? Or like, where, where do you work and in what kind of formats do these do these? It has been um, in different places, mm -hmm. but um, Giles moved in the same month as I gave birth to, um, to my baby son. And then the pandemic happened when he was five months. So we haven't been able to travel yet. So I actually haven't been to his place yet. I've only seen wonderful pictures. Um, I expect there will be retreats held there in, in the future. Um, and some of the organizations we work with now are based in the UK and can actually go there. So it's part of the process that we run, that they have these uh, daily or maybe two days um, of nature immersion. So it's it's combined with the process that we run virtually, that they go to his wonderful place um, and have that deeper in nature immersion. And so, so um, two things like you with with Giles, you set up the the regenerators, and and that's now growing. And Jenny's the work that you're doing with Jenny and the um, generators journey is. Is sort of under that umbrella and um, tell me a bit more about both of those the, like the, the regenerators and and the journey you mentioned it earlier so it's interesting because i have a, a, a long history of, of of starting organizations and hiring employees and and, and doing all those things fundraising and, and and whatnot and and coming out of of my kind of injury healing and and being able to to work again, which, which for a long time wasn't really sure, but when I was able to, to function and work again, um, I had a year where I gave myself, um, the rule was I was not allowed to launch anything. I just had, I had to just be and ride and I went on my own kind of... That's um, of an enabling constraint. You yeah, said. exactly, exactly. That's a much better word. I was not allowed <laughs> to do that because I was still a bit fearful of that, if that old personality of mine would just take over. Um, so Jazz and I launched Regenerators and as, as, a, as an ecosystem of regenerative practitioners, um, not any employees, but it's more a platform for us to do uh, aligned projects together that is aligning with a regenerative future. So that's that's that the only work I do and have done for the last four years is focused on regenerative projects. And, and I work solely on projects on the regenerators platforms. And then sometimes with Giles, sometimes with Jenny, sometimes with Lean. Um, I don't know if you know Lean Gorison. She's just uh, written a, a brilliant book as well, and she's been part of some of the retreats as well. She's a biologist that have very much a, a um, a biomimicry angle, but also have worked a lot within transition design. What's the name of the book? Um, let me see. Natural Intelligence, I believe. Um, Building the Future of Innovation on Millions of Years of Natural Intelligence. Um, so she has uh, an organization called 
NI, natural intelligence. So the whole purpose of Regenerators is not to start another kind of rigid organization with, with, um, with employees and um, a lot of responsibility in terms of how much revenue we need to create constantly. Um, I, for me, it's important to have a lifestyle where sometimes I can retreat if I sense there is a need with, within me for diving deep again, spending more time in nature. So I have no desire of ever becoming um, the head of something again with employees um, that I have a responsibility for. So it's Regenerators is a collaborative platform um, and um, it may grow, it may not, but the, it, the, the importance is that it's strongly rooted in regenerative principles. Um, so the intention is not to necessarily scale and grow big. And the, the regenerators journey that you hosted with, with Jenny, um, is that going to be an ongoing process? Or are you transforming it and doing something else? Or, well, like because it was quite a success. I, I, yes. I, uh, 150 people signed up or something like that um yes we did one in the spring and we did one in the autumn um and um and and we were surprised that it was um that easy to to attract people we we, we didn't we barely did any marketing but there was clearly a need for that um and we ran to um really great really great journeys and it, it was a pleasure also to to host that with jenny um, we are actually discussing next week what is the right next step. Um, instead of just doing more of the same because we had success, um, we wanted to just kind of stop in our tracks and retreat and reflect and sense into what is the right next step. Um, as you know, I live on a permaculture farm right now with my family. Um, and I also sense a deep need in me of a, of a restorative winter. It's quite demanding to energetically, energetically to deeply hold space for, for that many people for, for 12 weeks at a time. So we are not doing any new journeys in the, in the very near future. We may decide to do shorter journeys or do a one day events or whatever. That's what we need to figure out next week. But we have something really special with the Regenerators community. And there's still a lot of discussions going on in the Mighty Networks community that we that we created alongside the journeys. Um, so we will we will sense in together what is the right next step for the regenerators journey. Regardless, it was an incredibly um, deep learning experience, also for Jenny and I, um, holding space for that journey in the in the in the important year of 2020 we launched it just a few weeks into the into the pandemic um, and it has been really special to hold that kind of space for for, for, for the journey travelers in, in 2020 and the and the format was a series of web meetings with the large group and then it was in between. We had the process in a way where um, it wasn't just us downloading a lot of content we had knowledge weeks and circle weeks. The knowledge weeks was, was more about us delivering key knowledge pieces within regenerative wisdom. Um, and we, the first module was about the story of separation. We, we had a presentation around that and then they discussed that in random pairs or in groups. And then we had the circle weeks, which were uh, them discussing in the same group. They had their own circle group discussing the same questions with the same people so over time they get got to know each other really well and could go really deep on those kind of questions so it was a combination of, of deep inner development but also key content pieces in terms of um, frameworks that, that they could use for application into into their uh, situation whether they were city planners or executives or designers or NGOs or whatever their backgrounds were. Did, did, you, did you split them up into small groups? Yes, so, so they were in groups of six. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that's, a, that's a nice design. Um, and were they themed or purposely cross-themed? Because that's always a choice. Like you, if, you, if you have like 
lots of designers and policy makers and business leaders. You, there's always, do I put the business leaders together so they can have a sharing between themselves? Yeah. Of their, their and we actually did both in the, in the spring. It was deliberately uh, as diverse as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the feedback was that some of them longed to discuss with with people that were having this in the same kind of situations as they were. Um, so we 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 redesigned a bit um, in the autumn. So it was more so so in the knowledge week they met with with random people. So they got to meet a lot of people in the community, and then every second uh, Thursday they met with their circle groups, which were people that were in, in similar positions so they could learn from each other. And you let them self-facilitate in the circle group, so... Yes, yes. So we taught them about circle practice and how to hold a space and how to listen deeply. Um, yeah, so they, they could facilitate those processes themselves. And they then we were tapping into collective intelligence when the groups were constantly out in groups and then together so that we could learn from each other and and get inspired by the whole group as well. And and this move to Portugal that you you made um, is there is do you see it as something that might be a, a longer term move or is it just right now and it's the perfect place to be during a pandemic? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the backdrop behind you, and it, ever since we started the conversation, I thought that it's so beautiful. It has that wabi sabi um, kind of like with with the laurel drying on the door and um, just. I yeah, know. it's very beautiful here and we, we've been very fortunate. We lived um, in an apartment in, in, this, in the city of Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, when the pandemic hit. And we were in the process of exploring um, moving out. Um, we, we had actually just uh, signed the contract and, and, and had thought we had bought a house three days before I had my injury. And thankfully it didn't go through because it would have been impossible to re renovate um, a house while going through a deep, a deep healing um, process. Um, so we got stuck in the city apartment for longer than we had anticipated. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, we were just desperate um, to get out and, and be closer to nature. And um, I live on a farm that is called the Co-Project Farm that was, um, renovated and initiated and launched by um, by a wonderful Australian s systems thinker called Leila Jaralu. Um, I don't know if you've heard about her. Um, does a lot of within systems design and circular economy. And um, I have facilitated workshops with here in the past uh, about regenerative systems design and I love the place. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, she was looking for someone to rent out this place for a year and um, me and my family and another family that we that we knew uh, jumped on the opportunity so we are here for a year and it's also a way for us to sense into um, what kind of lifestyle would we want to create for ourselves in in, in the future um, so it's a permaculture farm with two donkeys and six goats and um, a lot of uh, a lot of um, ducks and chickens and it's just wonderful to, to experience um, permaculture gardening and being close to soil and, and having that communion and that relationship with land. And you, do you have support running it or do you, are you taking care no. of all the animals and all the land? It's, it's just, it's, I mean, just, we just grow food for ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's just us two families that are taking care of the garden. How, how do you live this? Because I mean, one thing that, came up earlier as you were speaking was this of course we need to create these spaces where the the where we can like in in the language of regenesis um where we can build a field where we can create yeah. um a community of practitioners that are on the same path and 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 have shared frameworks of thinking that support each other in their evolutionary journey of of exploring what is regeneration um, but I, I find personally at the moment a, a strong tension between the hyper local work, so the farm, like just recently took on custodianship of a piece of land and, and part of me would just love to spend the next few years with my daughter on that land, very hyper local every now and then inviting people into our bubble 
and the pandemic seems to <laughs> sort of almost force that on on people at the moment. But then the next ring out for me would be the work that I came to Mallorca for 10 years ago, um, because Mallorca is an island that is a perfect case study for bioregional regenerative development um, work and how to, without, because it's a, there's a tension of, like, I, I don't want to create some sort of leadership role of the one who talks about or helps shift an entire island. For me, that's full of um, mm -hmm. egoic energy and full of um, hubris being a foreigner. Yeah. This is not even my island. I, I just love this island, but I... Yeah. Um, but it, so, so there's tension between the very, very local, our farm and mm -hmm. the people around it, getting close with the neighbors, getting close with the people in the village, uh, paying attention to my daughter's schooling and, and, and mm -hmm. making connections through the kids would be a wonderful pass for the next few years. The, the next level out would be doing more systemic work around the whole island. Mm -hmm. But then there's all this also very important work that is global, that is, that is about advocacy and, and, and also learning across the networks of the, the different, like more landscape re restoration in the mm -hmm. decade of um, ecosystems restoration that has just started or more supporting people everywhere to do bioregional work. And I, I find that there's a real tension in that. Like also the amount of energy I've put into social media over the last four years since since my book came out, um, when prior I was completely anti-social media. Um, on the one hand, it's been enormously gratifying. But on the other hand, I do sense that I have to walk a fine line of not becoming captive to to that feeding that process um and it's because so much of this is about coming home to place and coming home to region and this this deep process of re-inhabitation at the bioregional scale to to do both the community healing the personal healing and the healing of place um at least that's 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 how i see it and and i i find that there's a bit of a tension between how do we weigh our energies between this pulsing of making sure that there is global collaboration and knowledge, knowledge exchange, that we collaborate on building structures that can bring funding to these kind of processes. And, and there's a lot of need for these global conversations. But I've, I've also seen how that just takes energy away from stuff actually getting done, that people yeah. fall in love with this, I'm a networker and just hyper network, but, but yeah. I, I completely understand where you're coming from and I think you and I have maybe been on a different journey because my work used to be very, I mean we did a lot of campaigning and a lot of um, outreach and I have this fatigue around it. Mm. Um, I pop into LinkedIn and very rarely Facebook um, but I pop in here and then and share a bit but I, I'm, I'm, I have this fatigue around it because I've been I, I, yeah, I've just kind of overdosed on it a bit. Um, and I completely understand that need for just being present. And where I'm coming from is, I think we need to see it as a tree. We need the very strong taproot. We need that anchoring. Mm -hmm. And we need that acceptance that there is a time and place for everything. And and right now, maybe it is about that really strong taproot. You've just taken over the custodianship of, of, of a piece of land. Maybe that's what your soul is calling for deeply to have that presence and have that time and not being scattered in many different kinds of projects. That's uh, something that I have been through over the past couple of months of constantly sitting with that tension of, the excitement around people finally wanting to hear about regenerative business, but also just, I just, I just don't want to be in another Zoom call. I just want to be on the land. I just want to be with my kids. I just don't want to work. I just don't want to constantly be behind delivering on things, on chapters for books and on da da da, da. I mean, you know that feeling. Um, and, and it's something that I'm still trying to figure out but I think where I'm with that question right now is that 
I have to be strong in alignment with what my soul is craving. And I have to trust that that will make sense. So I have reduced a lot of the clutter and I have said no to a lot of projects to carve out time to just truly be. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it, I think it's always an ongoing journey. Like I, 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 I certainly have in the last two years spent a huge amount of time just saying no. Yeah. Like, and then sometimes I'm a bit frustrated because, because, because I, I care deeply about mm -hmm. anybody reaching out to me saying, look, here's my project. Um, would love to talk to you about it. But of course, in the days where I got one of those a month, I gladly, I felt sort of yeah. touched by the fact that somebody would want to talk to me about their project and I made the time. But when you get five of them a week, um, then I, I, I had this realization sometimes where I was like, looked over the, because I, I don't really schedule very well. And sometimes I look back at what, what did I actually do this week? And, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and then you realize that like uh, I've, I've had weeks where I basically just spend time talking to people about their project and, and not yeah. with a financial exchange, just making it a sort of energetic exchange. And, um, and then I fall even further behind on all the other things that I, I also want to do that also. And that's not regenerative because that doesn't feel you're not revitalizing yourself. You're not restoring your creative capacity for do, to do the work you're really here to do. And I think that's an important realization for us as regenerative practitioners and regenerative passionate people that we need to think about our own strongly nourished tap root first. We just, we just have to, or else we are. Yeah. I mean, that's, I always frame, frame that with the, with the kind of most indigenous wisdom traditions. Mm -hmm actually hold a common core of this living the question energy that that it, i mean it's worded in different ways but but one way of wording it would be say that, that truly important decisions that might affect future generations always have to be taken with with three questions in mind does it serve myself does it serve the community and does it serve life yes and and the interesting bit is that the world that I come from over the last 20 years in the NGO world, the kind of burned out climate activists and so on and so forth, they find it really hard to ask the first question. And for me, it was a very long journey to realize that if you don't ask that question of how does it serve myself, you're undermining your capacity to serve community and serve life. Yes. It's not an ego trip of me first or anything. And, and that's also why, why I, I, I put out last year this this saver like because more and more people frame the shift that we're in as the shift from ego to eco mm -hmm. and, and of course there are very pathological degenerative ways that we've been captured in a certain egoic energy but but ego is also important like self-care self-love self yes nurturing is the basis of being able to to serve in the long term and and that's for me it, it is and that but but also because of that then i i when when i get these invitations where people say in an email like it sounds wonderful what they're trying to do and mm -hmm. and then they attach a 20 page pdf and then they say can you talk to me next week and i say i'm, I'm sorry like now we're, you're crossing a sort of fine line where you're not really doing the external considering you you, you you're in in your vision so much that you don't understand what you're asking me is to spend yes. five, six, seven hours of my time to feed your project. And I just can't do it all the time, yeah. but I feel really bad because, because I, I, yeah, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, but that, that is the most regenerative thing to do. Mm -hmm. The more we are connected with ourselves, the more time we spend in nature, the more we are in tune with how, what is our, bodily reaction to every kind of request. I take it very seriously to sit with it and sense what is, how is my body feeling? Am I excited? Or do I feel that kind of heavy energy, but my head is saying, this is a really good opportunity and you need to be out there and you need to blah, blah, blah. When I'm in that kind of space, I have made it, and I have made it sort of like a, a way of being to say no 
and sit with the discomfort of, 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 of disappointing people. And that's just part of life. Mm. But then it creates the space for the right things to emerge. It, it creates the space for me to feel nourished and appreciated in my work that I do t- decide to do. Mm. And then I can show up from a different space, right? Without that kind of the hints of um, what is the right English word of feeling taken advantage of, yeah. for example. There's a t- touch of that sometimes, uh-huh. but yeah, no, it's it, I th- it it's definitely an ongoing journey for me. This because I I also then always observe myself breaking my own rules of 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 you of must say yeah, and but then when I look look at it. It's well back to that D. H. Lawrence quote: "Are you a prisoner to the idea of yourself?" Like asking it myself. Uh, um, it sometimes in that, like I see, I get anxious because I've taken on too much, and I'm kind exactly. of. Well, exactly. You, you mentioned book chapters earlier. My one of my very core patterns, which I'm in the middle of with at least three papers at the moment, is when when academic journals ask me to write something. I, I feel honored and I say yes with some of them, particularly when there's a personal relationship and there always is to the person asking. And then, then I've, I've seen this pattern now that, that those are the ones that I say yes to. And then six months later, I say, no, I can't do it. Sorry. Uh, because they just take so much time and they, yes. nobody reads them anyway. And, and I don't need an academic portfolio. No, exactly. I'm never going to go into a university. They're too, too slow. I, I, I gladly work with universities. But it's it's this um, with other projects. Often it has been me breaking my rule of not saying no. That then afterwards, at the end of the year, I kind of go, I'm really glad I I overloaded myself and did that anyway because it mm-hmm. it it catalyzed something meaningful in the world. And and so it's it's yeah it's it's an ongoing dance. Um, I completely uh, know that dance. Yeah. Uh, and... I imagine so. And as the deeper we are connected with our intuition, the better, right? In terms of letting that be our guide and in, in terms of the right next step, constantly being in tune with the right next step for us. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's really how I've lived my life um, always. Like, the, the, yeah. I mean, sometimes you, you do commit to something and then you sort of, in a, mm. in a commitment over longer periods of time and that's not always like... the the dynamics of that can be a bit feeling mm-hmm. trapped in something, but but really, whenever I feel trapped in something, I, I change it completely, um, quite quickly. Like, right. like, it's it's I, I just really listen into the, what you were describing this tension between the head and the heart, and the, particularly the gut feeling. This mm-hmm. this, but but I also noticed that lately, and this is where I'm, I'm sometimes wondering: is this one of the stories I tell about myself for myself? Um, this getting a bit anxious, getting a bit stressed, waving my arms about them, don't you see? And like that energy, yeah. it's my ginger head energy. It's it's just who, who I am to some extent. Um, sometimes I've, I feel like I need to overload myself in order to really be creative. Um, and and I don't know if that is just a story that, that I need to let go of or whether it is actually the secret source of, of having done what I've done until now um, because of it. So, I think it's yeah. probably a bit of both, and it's something that Jazz and I have also discussed many times. I mean, because both he and I have had to let go of old ways, um, but there's also a sense of um, appreciation of our former selves of actually having done that work that we can build on now, and that is a, a foundation. Um, I think it's more about being aware that on every action has an energetic frequency and being aware around what is the quality of that frequency and that exchange and is that of the caliber that we want to be driving change in this world or is it not and can we start to cultivate that awareness around everything we do emails that we write partnerships we say yes or no to um yeah it's an ongoing journey. I'm realizing we're, we're having a very long conversation and people get really put off when, when they... 
see for 120 minutes like uh, uh, these conversations are always very long but 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 getting getting over the 90 minute mark um is probably not such a good idea no. um, I, I i would suggest we we end the recording and just have a little bit more of a chat before we um finish it was but, wonderful to have this sharing with you daniel thank you so much no it's, it's really nice and it's the beginning of of many conversations I'm, I'm sure and i hope i hope to one day visit you in in portugal and and likewise when this madness with the pandemic um has run its way um hopefully you can come and visit mallorca but, um so thank you very much and i'll just stop the recording <laughs>